Welcome to the 22nd and penultimate episode of Season 3 of the Ubuntu UK Podcast. It's Monday the 6th of December 2010, and in this episode we're going to have two segments that aren't written in the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to introdu- uh, interview Cassidy James from the Ubuntu Adverts team, That's the one. and we're going to talk about something else that is yet to be decided. We will, of course, cover the latest news events, bit about Ubuntu, command line love, and go over your feedback. I'm Alan, <laughs> and with me this week is Tony, Mark, and Laura. Hello, hello. 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 And you all went somewhere I didn't this week. Where did you go? To our happy place. <laughs> <laughs> and we got free toast. Oh, I, I didn't get invited. And bacon sandwiches. And chili. You went yeah. to bar camp in we Southampton. We did. We went to we Southampton did. bar camp. And it was very good. It was. It was really good. Yeah. Where was it? It was in a pub, wasn't it? Two pubs. Two pubs. Wow. For the price of one. Mm. <laughs> one pub is just not big enough. So what did you go and see, Tony? Uh, I saw uh, a few interesting talks, um, uh, none of which readily spring to mind, but they were all <laughs> fascinating. Uh, as, there was a guy called um, Proactive Paul, uh-huh. I don't think that's his real name, who gave a talk about um, running your own business mm-hmm. and stuff. And uh, it's something I'm looking in at the moment in terms of... Um, personal motivation and stuff so uh, he was quite interested in talking about that sort of thing are we not motivating enough for you? <laughs> <laughs> you're petrifying um and yeah so that was really interesting and there were a few other bits and bobs of talks they had um a widget that made things like a 3d printer and uh, mm-hmm. um a sort of bizarre hovercrafty thing oh yeah you, you spent some time that was really that. cool it was like a um uh like a helicopter with four blades and it was running linux and had a wireless access point and you could connect it with a laptop or with a phone and it had cameras on it and stuff, so it could hover and track things and all sorts of cool stuff. Were there lots of beards there, Laura? Not so many. Lots of ponytails. Well, what about the blokes? <laughs> <laughs> lots of ponytails. Um, uh-huh. But that's probably about as far as it went. Cool. It was quite a mixed crowd, wasn't it? It was, yeah, really. It wasn't you know, just floss people, open source people. There were quite a few people there from that community. There was a wider kind of range of Java developers and people who play with iphones and, and were there non non open sourcey type talks or anything i think mostly they were open sourcey um the first one being an introduction to vi or vim Ooh. <laughs> um, in, did, in quite did, an did hugo one. get upset about it not being emacs I, I hugo was late he was late yes. <laughs> <laughs> he missed that one that was probably for the better <laughs> um, and there was a quick um quick fire one where the guy at the front actually just hosted everybody shouting out their favorite shortcut that was quite good. Literally. What, keyboard shortcut? Keyboard yeah. shortcut or bash wow. command. Sort of like a command line love. It was really, but keyboard but shortcut. fast. <laughs> yeah. I like that. It was just all the audience just shouting out. Command line quickie. Um, was any of it videoed or recorded? Do any of you no. record or anything? Um, there, was, there was going to be someone videoing it, but their camera broke. Oh, so um, it didn't turn up. I took a morning, few photos, yes. but um, there was no kind of formal videoing. There okay. wasn't much formal anything, really. And are they, <laughs> they going to do it again? They, I, ha- they have promised to. Yeah. <laughs> well, that... they, it, it, was, it was that they were promising to at that time. You remember after you do Og Camp, uh, <laughs> or just after it's finished, and we, we, it feels like, okay, it's, it went all right, and everybody seemed to enjoy it, and it was fun, and you just remember the fun bit. just buzzing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They were in that phase when they agreed to do it, so right. hopefully when the, uh, the metaphorical hangover wears off, they'll still be prepared to do so. Excellent. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. What about you, Alan? <laughs> <laughs> what did Thanks. you do? Thank you for asking. Um, I installed the Ubuntu One for Windows beta. You know, the um, oh, at yes. the moment, oh. Ubuntu One is only available on Ubuntu. Yes. Mm-hmm. Although I think you can put the client on other Linux distros. Um, but uh, someone has started developing a Windows version. Yeah, we mentioned it in the last episode that it was mm. a closed beta. So you're yeah. on the inside on that one. Well, no, I just I, I hit the button a week or so ago and asked to join the beta. And I got an email saying, hey, join the beta, download the client and install it. It's it's a pretty hefty client to, to do because you've got to have .NET 4.0 or something, you know, pretty recent. And um, and sadly, it didn't work for me because I'm behind a proxy at work and it wouldn't oh. work. And it doesn't, it doesn't uh. support proxies. So I filed a couple of bugs. Um, it looks quite nice. You know, you've got a little tray icon and all that malarkey, but mm-hmm. um, it's not quite there yet. Did but, it actually do the file syncing thing? No, because I'm behind a proxy. So, so you, none of it works. It didn't work at home? or no. right, okay. Oh, I didn't try at home. Okay. But, uh, oh, you've only got Windows at work? Yes. Ah. Is the standard is answer. This the, <laughs> <laughs> is the answer we expect you to give. Excellent. Yes. So I think that's, that's the intro. Really. Shall we get on with it? Yeah, yeah, let's get on yeah. with it. The news this week has been filled with the latest stories published from whistleblowing site WikiLeaks. 
The backlash against the site and its infrastructure has cast light on concerns over freedom of information online. Should information always be free? At what cost? And who really controls the internet? Google. (laughs) The American government. Well, that's the way it seems to be going. Mm. Yeah, one of the things that the open source community likes is this idea of information freedom and sharing stuff. And then... um, somebody comes along and shares a huge amount of, of secret data in this in this way and um you know you find yourself questioning is this the right thing to be doing it should information really always be free or are there times when actually it's it might be better to keep this stuff secret well there's a lot of people that seem to have pointed out you yes some of this information is probably useful to know even if we in inverted commas shouldn't know it because it's mm. you know secret or top secret or however it's class, classified but the sa- the same and and feeling that you should defend the right of people to you know expose wrongdoing and expose um corruption um, yeah. and this this highlights you know people doing that but then i probably wouldn't want my personal information my conversations with you that we've had that are private and conversations that i've had <laughs> with my wife that are private you sure. know whether they're emails or chats or or you know verbal conversations i wouldn't want that to become well, there's Public. one of the things that the Facebook uh, founder, Mark Zuckerberg, has said is, you know, that there, is, there is no privacy anymore. You know, there's no privacy on the, inter- on the internet. You know, and, and the logical extension of that is that, you know, all of your photos or all of your conversations, you know, could be up online and sort of discoverable by people. You know, privacy is, is a myth. Privacy online is a myth. Yet that's not a very comfortable feeling for a lot of people. And isn't that just serving an end to him by saying that <laughs> well yeah and and there are people i think there are people who still manage to keep themselves relatively private online mm. yet still lead an online life there was a there's a guy recently who complained because we put something on the ubuntu wiki um which could lead to someone being able to figure out that guy's home address it was some right tracking information like a parcel delivery thing and you know if you put that tracking number without any kind of password or anything into a UPS or whatever website, mm. you could possibly find out the guy's address. And he was really uncomfortable about that because he's tried very hard to keep himself, you know, separated personally from his online persona, as it were. Right. And so, I, yeah, I, I think it is possible to be, to be private and still be online. So long as, you know, you don't do things like sign up to Facebook and mm. put your real name and date of birth and stuff into stuff. Yeah. And, one of the things that's happened to the WikiLeaks guys is they've had their they had their DNS hosting taken away, and they had their website hosting taken away, and they had um, you know other resources, their PayPal account that people were using to donate to support them taken away. And one of the things about cloud computing is that you know you trust all of this stuff to other companies. Yet this is a good example of why perhaps it's not always wise to do so, and how dependent you can become on third parties who are just companies. Yeah, and there are you know plenty of good reasons why people don't like ubuntu one or don't like dropbox yeah. and would rather yeah. use something like sparkle share or mm, ifolder or whatever you know that you can run on your own your own server but even then is it really your own server i have a, a vps from bitfolk and if they got a court order from uh, if someone sent them a court order then they would probably relinquish you know details about me if yeah. they were demanded to by law yeah, um, and there's not much I can do about that, even though I think that's my server. Yes, you know, so so that it doesn't it doesn't stretch to every single thing. Part of the issue that's come up with the WikiLeaks thing, though, is it's not just people going to a company with a court order; it's government saying, you know, you shouldn't be supporting these people, and the company saying, yeah, you're right. Let's um, you know, let's shift them off to another country, I, perhaps, or I, shift them somewhere else. I thought Amazon and PayPal both said it was just a transgression of their terms of service. I don't. I, they both allege that they've not been contacted by the American government. Or well, no, I mean service. they've they've definitely not. Well, I say they they allege they've not been contacted, but the people in the American government have publicly said, you know, American companies shouldn't be oh, shouldn't, shouldn't be, be yeah. supporting yeah. these people. And if they recognise it as being illegal, which is what the American government's saying in some cases, then that it probably does transgress their terms of service. Yet yeah, no allegations have been made of any illegal activity. Yeah, that's no. the other than thing that... Bradley Manning, who allegedly <laughs> got the data in the first place. The thing they come, the company they're hosted with now in Sweden has said publicly is they will take it down if they believe it breaches Swedish law, mm. but not for any other reason than that. Yeah, one of the... Um, 
the, the things that the, uh, came up in, in this week, uh, sorry, during the week in this context was that the Pirate Bay people want to run their own DNS namespace, effectively. Yeah. Now, this is one thing that has unified the whole world since uh, 1984, whenever ARPANET became the internet, um, is that everybody uses the same domain namespace. And but as in, as in um, everybody shares the common root DNS servers. There are, I think, about 14, 15 of them uh, around the world. And there is one unique namespace that covers .com, .org, and .uk, and .jp, and all the other country codes. Um, and everybody abides that. You have a unique entry within that space. But there's nothing to stop you configuring your computer to use a whole different set of root name servers, which could provide a whole different set of namespaces. You could have an Amazon.com on a different namespace that's a completely different company, a different entity, leaving aside any legal trademark or kind of, you know, <laughs> that sort of dispute. You, the Pirate Bay guys or anybody else could set up some DNS servers and say, look, this is the DNS servers for our own namespace and we can decide what top-level domains we're going to create and how we're going to delegate that out and how we're going to manage and run it. And potentially they could say we're going to manage it in a much more free way than the... I can do, who are the US based company who um, manage the existing namespace and how there are concerns over their neutrality, for example. Mm. But it will be a huge split in the, yeah. in the yeah. internet because, as far as I'm aware, most software you could only use one or the other. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it could be a sea change in the way that we use the internet. Hasn't that been mooted numerous times in the past, though? People wanting more uh, control over DNS and wanting you know their own top level domains that. that represent what they think should be you know the kind of domains that they they envisage rather than you know one corporation deciding it i'm sure it has been suggested before but it'd be interesting to see if it could work yeah i mean you do end up with all sorts of odd top level domains that have sprung up just because there's enough people behind it like you know you can get dot museum if you run a museum and things like that which aren't particularly you know i don't think i've ever visited a dot no, museum but you can get it because there's enough <laughs> people who bothered i can into making it available mm. One of our contributors, uh, Undefined, uh, on the IRC channel, said you can actually mer merge DNSs locally, if DNSs is the correct plural of multiple DNS servers or something. <laughs> but yeah, so you know, it might be possible to integrate a, an independently run namespace and the main traditional ICANN govern namespace. On a little geeky technical note there. As long as they don't conflict, I, I assume. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think they're working around it well enough by asking people to mirror the WikiLeaks yeah. stuff. They seem to have hundreds. I mean, I, I saw a stat that they had three to five hundred, you know, hosts already mm. that were mm. just mirroring the content, and that seems to be working fairly well. Okay, you can't go WikiLeaks.org or something and go straight <laughs> to the site. Yeah, but it doesn't take half a brain to find those mirrors. But is there a, a essential freedom of speech debate? I mean, in America, in particular, they have that right enshrined in their constitution. And okay, if, if it was a if it was. Um, utterly illegal content you know, uh, you know child porn or something like that i don't think people will be arguing about the steps that have been taken to take it down but because this is uncomfortable content for governments it's a bit more of a question as to whether it's right for, for them to take it down well they already have for other content not uh, completely unrelated to um, wikileaks um they've gone after some torrent sites that they said were linking to um it, in inverted commas, illegal content. Oh, yes. So yeah. this is this is not sites that are hosting like MP3s or anything. They're hosting torrent files, and they've had their DNS changed. And if you visit these particular sites, you, you find there's just a notice that says, you know, the DNS for this has been, you know, taken away. Without any prosecution, without going through mm. the judicial process, it's just, bam, gone. So yes, I would say they have too much control. Of being able to just knock a site offline by taking away its DNS entries mm. is just wrong. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Without any kind of control and any kind of process around that, illegal process around that, yeah. it's completely wrong. Yeah. If they don't like what the Guardian has been doing, could they, you know, via some process, knock the Guardian offline, knock the Washington Post offline, mm. knock the Spiegel offline, and all these sites that are the five newspapers that are they're helping to distribute the WikiLeaks information and disseminate mm. the information, they could knock them all offline if they wanted to. And yeah, one of the things that um, has come up with the WikiLeaks thing, and one of the reasons that their um, DNS provider said that they um, removed their, uh, their domain was that they were being hammered with um, DDoS attacks. Now, 
I'm not going to be all conspiratorial about this, but I'm not entirely certain that the DDoS attacks were just coming from some hacker in his bedroom. It I, seems more likely to me that they were, I'm not necessarily saying the American government, but someone who didn't like what WikiLeaks were saying and was affected by what WikiLeaks were saying, perhaps sanctioning or even launching these attacks themselves. More and that is a really... Encouraging them. Yeah, at least encouraging them. And that is a very scary thought that there are, you know... Well, it reflects I, a little bit on the, what we talked last time about the Stuxnet virus, which yeah. looked like it could have been specifically targeted by people who knew what they were doing against Iranian um, systems. I do like the the company that um, used to provide WikiLeaks DNS was Easy DNS, and I do like their front page. If you look at it now, it says they have a, a banner that says "We are the company that did not take down WikiLeaks." Oh, right, <laughs> with an explanation as to exactly why, and they they say you know they're. Uh, uh, low price you know cut yeah. price dns provider and they just couldn't stand up to to that kind of attack yeah <laughs> but i guess there's a there was a, a case recently that eff reported about ICANN taking down a whole heap of the domain names were they the ones you were talking about before yeah was that a separate lot okay yeah. so this is them again just kind of saying oh we're gonna get rid of them because somebody's asked us to and it's no kind of innocent until proven guilty is it which is times has tens, sorry which is kind of how justice hopefully should work yeah. in the free world you'd like to hope so yeah. Um, one of the other things that people have, have come up with is the idea of distributed DNS, which is, um, you know, kind of a peer to peer network of, of DNS, which allows anybody to set up anything and, re- and find anything else on the net. Um, and I'm not quite sure how, how well that could work, but that would give you utter freedom from any DNS namespace. You know, the idea you just set your own thing up and go and be, as long as it's presumably some. Unique. It does, it does feel like it's, it's a very, this whole WikiLeaks thing is very geeky driven because, you know, if you look at the how to's that people have created for how to set up your own WikiLeaks, leaks mirror it's like get yourself a debian box <laughs> really <laughs> yeah <laughs> and do the following use apache and use this and set up an ssh key and you know it's all it's all stuff that we it's in fact similar kind of setup that we have for mirroring the podcast <laughs> 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 which is, look kind of familiar to me um where is dave <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen him for a long time. <laughs> I think um, he might be he... hiding somewhere in the British countryside. Yeah. Not since he dyed his hair. That's strange. <laughs> so, so it, it it kind of, I think some of the the, the geeky types kind of, whether they sympathise with um, the guy who runs WikiLeaks or not, they, there's something about that kind of anarchic maverick kind of yeah feel that that goes along with the open source. You know, not using mainstream you know, a little bit punk, a little bit, you know, mm. a little as, bit as different. Ethan Z or Ethan Z, I don't know, uh, said on Twitter, you know, I don't know if I'm pro WikiLeaks, but I know I'm anti, anti WikiLeaks. Yeah. I've heard a lot of people say that Simon Phipps said the same kind of thing. Oh, okay. And a few other prominent people have said they don't, they don't like the idea of, you know, the censorship, not, yeah. not liking WikiLeaks. Yeah. Whether, yeah. whether you like what he said or not, you don't want it to go away. Or sorry, what the, what they're doing, you don't want it to go away. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'm, I'm not entirely convinced that, all the stuff that he's publishing should necessarily come out, or there's a benefit of it coming yeah. out, particularly if it's a load of essentially minutia. But the fact that people have taken down the site and that they've taken all these efforts to kind of get rid of the site offends my sensibility of yeah, net neutrality absolutely. and freedom of speech. Really. So will you be mirroring WikiLeaks? Um, what, off this internet connection? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we struggle yeah. on that front. But yeah. um, Good answer. Yeah. But he seems to have got lots of mirrors at the moment, and I don't want the... Uh, the government to come after me (laughs) but then i guess that's the problem i guess that's what they want people to think isn't it cool okay well if you've got um any thoughts on that and you'd like to send them in you can email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org or get in touch with us by any of the means that we'll talk about right at the end of the show And now it's time for some news. Google Wave has been accepted into Apache Incubator, presumably with a cry of, I'm not dead yet. The new Wave in a Box project allows people to set up their own Wave servers before wondering what to do with them and going back to email. Yeah, why would... Nobody used Wave when it wasn't in a box? (laughs) Maybe it's a really pretty box. (laughs) Like Apple. I think quite a lot of people did use it. Just to find out... No, no, just to find out what it was. Yeah. Yeah. And then stopped. And then stopped. (laughs) Yeah, I, I, every time I logged into it, I'd like, oh yeah, Google Wave, and I'll log into it, and there'll be loads of threads of stuff going on that I don't quite get, that I would be invi- invited Waves. to, oh yeah, that's it, Wade. <laughs> and I just couldn't quite fathom yeah. what was going on. So, why would you set up your own Wave server? 
maybe in a company if you yeah. wanted to use it internally or, or a community group like us community yeah. group or if you yeah i mean if you wanted to use the federated features and link yourself with other people's wave servers maybe i mean we've we've used various collaborative tools mm-hmm. we've used yeah. gobby yeah we've used wiki we've used um etherpad we use etherpad now yeah so these are the we're the kind of people who you know we're a group of people who would want to collaborate on a product yeah same sensible but if etherpad or gobby was hosted centrally would we be against using that for this but it is isn't it no, well <laughs> no dave runs it <laughs> yes no yes. but if it was hosted by Sorry. a central like a external google provider message. like google i don't see that there'd be any problem with its using it mm. So and yeah, yeah this we, goes back to the uh, the conversation we had during the news of someone deciding to knock us out. Because, yeah, you know, I don't think that'd be critical. Your, no, I, I think you're right. Yeah. For all we know, they already have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Symbian Foundation, which produces the it says popular <laughs> open source mobile operating system, has closed its website hosting open source code and documentation. <laughs> While the foundation says it will endeavour to make the content available to developers on request, this may spell the end of Symbian as an open source project. Oh. So I wonder how many people have actually asked for the source. And if it's not going to be on the web, how are you going to get it? So if They're going to post a DVD to you. Really? Yes. So That's, I could, <laughs> I could request good. it. So oh, if you've yeah, got, you've a, got Symbian a Symbian phone. I yeah. do. Okay, right. quick poll in this room. How many people have got a Symbian phone? That's one, then. That's just you, Laura. <laughs> right. What else have you got? I, I don't know what Yes, it's Samsung in it. Oh, bless. <laughs> <laughs> He's not a geek. <laughs> it's only just a phone. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. It's a pretty phone. <laughs> Go on, what have you got? I've got Android. And you've got both. I, iPhone and Android, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, well, see, it's not really set in the world on light, is it? No. I saw a review today, actually from an open source guy who reviewed the um, N8 which oh, is yeah. their latest I think is their latest Symbian phone and he pretty much panned it uh. said it was rubbish and Symbian's going nowhere and yeah that's just one guy's opinion but you know yeah. kind of, I kind of agree with him really yeah I'm, I mean I like my phone but after a lot of customising it Pro FTP, the popular open source FTP server, has announced that its servers were recently compromised and have been distributing a modified version of the software, allowing hackers backdoor access into users' servers. If they run Pro FTPD. Yes. Congratulations, you're running an even more insecure version of an already insecure protocol. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to get compromised. Wow. Yeah, people, people do use FTP, though, don't they? You know, people, you know, send me the files via FTP. Okay, before Dropbox and all that came along. It seemed to be FTP was the way people send files. Yeah, I've had to do business with a couple of companies who want you to upload stuff via FTP for diagnosis and stuff. Yeah, diagnostics. That's the word I was after. Yeah, at work we uh, we have to send you know very important, very secure data over FTP. Oh, that's reassuring. Well, it's, it's FTP. <laughs> is it SFTP? Yeah, it's SFTP. Oh, oh no, well, it's, no, it's the other one. FTPS. FTPS. <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. Not my decision. Fair enough. Microsoft has announced that the aerial imagery used in its Bing Maps service will be made available to the OpenStreetMap project. Key mappers will now be able to trace the images to create additional mapping data for the project, whilst OpenStreetMap founder Steve Coast will now be employed by Bing. This is good, isn't it? It is. It's definitely good. Mm. It's very good news. They so what's used... wrong with the Yahoo Maps that they were... They I did was... have a license. Yeah, those, they used to, be able to, used to be able to draw effectively over I think the, the, the difference is that Bing's maps are high resolution, I think. I've seen oh. a, a picture of what they've got and what Bing gives them side by side, and Bing's ones are, give you a much sort of more accurate thing to trace. So now there's no excuse for not having every post box and lab yeah. post. <laughs> 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 Freeprog, Norway's Open Source Competence Centre, reports that all county administration offices and a large majority of munis- blah, 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 <laughs> municipal offices now use open source software in some form. Examples of open source packages include asterisk for telephone systems and openoffice.org. And pro FTPD. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently. Yeah, this is good news. Yeah, it's yeah. nice to hear a success story. I love the fact that they have an open source competence centre. Yeah. I, I just have this mental image of lots of very organised Scandinavians sitting there going, yes, that is competent. <laughs> <laughs> In my mind. In your mind. Well, good job, Norway, and hopefully other people can follow that as well. Oh. Yeah. It's like a command line love. <laughs> That's quite gruff. <laughs> <laughs> Creepy. <laughs> yeah, okay. Here's that how, how you like it. <laughs> <laughs> he likes it, Gruff. Uh, what is your love this right. week? So, I, I, like most people, most non extreme geeks, have a domestic router at home. 
like just a Netgear D-Link or whatever yeah. thing. And I have a few machines behind it. And one of them I can SSH to. Um, and I wanted to SSH to another machine on my network. I was at work and I wanted to SSH home and then SSH to another machine to kick something off. But I didn't know the IP address of the other machine. Okay. Because it's just one of these domestic routers, it just dishes out IP addresses. And I never know which machine's got what IP address. Okay. Um, and I wondered how... What I used to do back in the old days was do a ping minus B to do a broadcast ping. Yeah. And all the machines would reply, and then I'd just go through them one by one. <laughs> <laughs> and there wouldn't be many of them. I haven't got hundreds of machines. No. But the problem with that is um, you can't do ping broadcast anymore. It doesn't work. Oh. Uh, well, Ubuntu doesn't reply to a ping broadcast. OS oh. 10 does, uh-uh. and various other machines on my LAN do. Ones that I can't what are they running? Uh, one's the Drobo. <laughs> <laughs> no Windows then. Just checking. No, I think, I think the Wii might uh, might be one. But wow. anyway, it's machines I wouldn't SSH into anyway. Sure. Um, SSH but what I wanted to is um, find out what the IP addresses were. And I've got this command. It's an Nmap command with a bunch of parameters. And it basically scans the network, but only scans the network for machines with port 22 open. So machines that have got SSH there. Mm-hmm. Cool. And it just works. Is it quick? Yeah, it is pretty quick. Yeah, I mean, well, scanning an entire network of, you know, half a dozen machines. It's not right. going to take that long. No, that's true. Um, but yeah, I mentioned that I wanted something to do this, and um, it was provided by David Ledbetter in uh, the Bitfolk IRC channel. So what do you do if you've got more than one host running SSH? Well, the cool thing is it actually tells you a fingerprint of the machine. Okay. And it tells you the version of SSH that it's running. Ah. So I can tell from the version of SSH that it's running which machine it is, or I can just SSH to it and figure it out. So what you want is a lookup, don't you, to the version of SSH against Ubuntu? Well, actually, it's not that hard, because I know what version of Ubuntu my machines are running. Right. So I know that if it's got a very high version number of SSH, then it's probably the most recent version of Ubuntu. Does this motivate you to keep all of your different systems on different versions of Ubuntu, (laughs) just so you can tell the difference? Or could you not just set up a local DNS? I could do, but I choose not to because I like this command. Okay, that's that's good. And we'll put that in the show notes, yes? Yes. And also, uh, David, when I was um, talking to him about this, he uh, gave me a link to a whole bunch of other nice short command lines, and uh, I'll post a link to that. As well. It's a really good page. Yeah, it's really nice. It's a one-page one summary of really cool command lines. Okay, cool. And that's the command line love for this time. Joining us on the line is Cassidy <laughs> James from the Ubuntu advertising team. How are you doing? Good, good. How are you? Not too bad, thank you. Uh, we're getting through this show slowly but surely. <laughs> <laughs> so, tell us about the Ubuntu advertising team. What's it all about? Well, the Ubuntu advertising team is um, <laughs> a team to advertise for Ubuntu. Uh, we're really working to produce a video and graphical adverts for Ubuntu, targeted to like a, a more non-technical public. Um, okay. Yeah, what what sort of run effort? What sort of adverts are you talking about? Television adverts, radio, newspapers? Yeah, um, we're mostly going to be working on, I think, web adverts and a video uh, to, to begin. Um, not not a television advert, but more online web video. Um, then we'd like to move to audio and um, print publications, too. Okay, you, you are aspiring to go to television in the future, is that right? Yeah, we'd, we'd like to. Um, not right away, because it's... it's expensive it takes money sure um, but you know at some point if we acquire some sponsorships or or somebody who's very generous with donating we would we'd like to move that direction so what would what would you start with first i guess you said websites and things what kind of websites would you aim for do you think um well our target audience is really more of a non-technical user you know the, the everyday user mm-hmm. so ideally wherever we can get ads um Obviously, a, an obvious one to start with would be on tech websites, uh, you know, tech blogs or, or web, uh, news websites. And uh, we would want to move into the more non-technical places to share more of um, what Ubuntu is, you know, because a, a lot of average people don't know what Ubuntu is to begin with. But that's kind of one of our goals is to get Ubuntu's name out there. On things like Facebook? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, we actually just acquired a, a, a social networking leader um, that'll help with social network advertising so um, you know do, maybe maybe even doing a social campaign of some sort but yeah advertising on facebook through their ad system so what uh, if you're if you're advertising ubuntu to, to the to the mass um market what what are the selling points you're going to use what, what how would you 
set it to people was the well, <laughs> selling point. Um, <laughs> one discussion, yeah, one discussion we talked about a lot was not necessarily focusing, at, at least at first, on the um, free as in money aspect of it. Because, you know, a lot of times people hear free and they just assume low quality. Um, so we really want to push more of the, the other good qualities of Ubuntu, such as the you know, ease of use, especially in the, the most recent version. The, the fact that it's free as in uh, you know, freedom. You have the freedom to do with it what you want. You're not locked into a proprietary uh, partnership or whatever. Cool. Um, so what sort of um, like resources and people have you already got as part of the team? Um, well, we have over 100 active members on the team already um, signed up through Launchpad, which is really good. And... and um, they're not just all sitting around. A lot of them are actually you know, actively in, engaged in the project. Um, people from all, all over the world who are photographers, um, animators, musicians, authors and editors, artists, and uh, translators, and then organizational leaders as well. And the the team um, has a laudable goal to advertise um, Ubuntu to uh, and advocate the use of Ubuntu to you know new users. Um, and a lot of loco teams already do that in their own region and in their own localized kind of way. And, and we've had um, a marketing team, an Ubuntu marketing, community marketing team for, for years. But they don't seem to have kind of achieved an awful lot as a team. People have come and gone and, um, and not really achieved, I think, what, what they set out to do. How, how are you going to um, avoid falling into that trap? What are you going to do to uh, prevent yourself dying off like the teams that have um, started before you? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, we have, we have a few ways we're going to kind of tackle that problem. Um, you know, first of all, we have really a really strong leadership team. We have four, four main leaders who are very devoted to the team and who have, uh, you know, we're putting together long-term plans for the team. So it's not just kind of, oh, let's get together and make some ads and then it falls apart. Um, we're planning both the advertisements and the project's plan. Um, secondly, we have you know regular scheduled bi- biweekly meetings uh, via our IRC, and in those meetings we meet and say, you know, okay, here's what happened in the past couple weeks. Here's what's going to happen in the next couple weeks, you know, um, and then we take input from the overall community and get their ideas and, and kind of set our plans from there. So I think the regular meetings really will help with keeping this plan on, keeping the project on track. So, obviously, Canonical uh, have some marketing efforts for Ubuntu at the moment. What support do you get from Canonical, if any, and, and how do you see your work meshing with theirs? Yeah, um, Canonical really, um, at least right now, has been really focusing on the corporate side of things. We want to focus more on the everyday user side of things. So, we've, you know, we're, we're a community-run project. We're not through Canonical necessarily, but we have talked with Mark Shuttleworth and He's given us some good ideas, and he's, he's told us that if we get some, you know, really good adverts together, that he would be willing to distribute them through the official Ubuntu channels, you know, the, the website and, and whatnot. And, of course, we're open to working with them. One, one interesting thing that Mark actually suggested, too, is he has connections with somebody uh, that's involved with a, a movie theater company. All right. And, uh, yeah, and we can, he said, if, if we produce, like, a short turn-off-your-cell-phone advert that also advertises Ubuntu somehow, uh, you could actually pull some strings and get that aired before movies throughout the UK. So don't let a cell phone spoil your movie, turn it off, even if it runs Ubuntu. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, somebody on IRC said, you know, is it, is it running Ubuntu? No, turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty yeah. Yeah. So what was the uh, motivation for starting the team? Was there something specific that triggered it? Well, it was really... Um, a guy named Jason O'Doom started the project on Launchpad, and his his initial goal was to create some some materials to distribute. It, it wasn't quite as big of a project as it turned into. Um, it kind of exploded with interest, um, but we really we really saw that there was no real obvious community supported effort to share the love of, of Ubuntu with the masses and with the everyday user. Um, so we kind of saw that hole and thought, you know, we can do something about this. We can we can fill that gap. Okay, so um, do you require uh, uh, assistance from the community? What sort of things are you looking for? Well, um, like I said, we have you know photo- photographers, animators, musicians, authors, editors, artists, and translators, and um, we can always use more of all of those. Um, specifically, probably looking at um, you know one group we're lacking a little bit in is the animators. Hmm. Um, 
be great to have people that are professional uh, animators or video editors um, that could bring and could help create content. Um, another area would be musicians. Uh, we have we have a few musicians on board, but it'd be cool to create you know kind of our own unique um, original audio theme that goes with the advertisements. It's almost a audio brand identity. So, do you, many of the people on the team have specific experience in marketing or advertising already? Yeah, we do have. Um, that's one one kind of audience we targeted for getting people to join the team was people mm-hmm. who are experienced with public relations or who are experienced with um, marketing. And we have some people that have, have written um, advertisements. We have some people that have actually uh, filmed filmed adverts before. And you know, with with the we have a couple profession professional level. I'm not sure if you know it's technically professional, but pr- they produce professional quality um, animations and and videos. And so we're real excited to have mm. them on the team. One of the um, the things that uh, will happen when you bring in. Uh, other people who are professional and already do this, maybe for a living or in their spare time, is they're probably already um, conversant with software that probably doesn't run on Ubuntu. Um, and uh, are you are you planning to set that as a stipulation that they should use free software, or are you okay with people using you know um, OS ten and Windows and the software that comes with it, or you know whatever software they currently use, or, or are you going to require them to use free software? to produce the adverts? Uh, well, you know, we, of course we'd prefer that they use open source software, free software, um, because, you know, that, that can become a almost a te- technology demo for the free software itself. But if we get somebody that's professional that comes in and wants to join the group, we're not going to prevent them from helping the community by requiring them to use free software. If they're very experienced, um, you know, we value their talent more than the software they use. Do you think that people in the open source community will hassle you about that approach? Yeah, of course. That's always a possibility. Um, whenever you leave open the opportunity to use free software or non-free software, um, but you know, it, it's up to it's up to the artist. You know, not the tool. Um, hmm. And I, I think you know it, our main goal is really to advertise Ubuntu. Our main goal is not necessarily to show what can be done with free software. Like I said, it would be nice if they all used the free software, but I don't, we're not going to require it. And I guess there's a difference between the tools that somebody might use as a video editing or an animation professional and the tools you would expect your, your, your average home user to use, for example. Exactly, yeah. Okay, so you talked a little bit about your goals there. C- can you tell me what kind of the six-month goal and the 12-month goal for the team are going to be? Sure, yeah. Um, and a 12-month goal, or a six-month rather, six-month goal we looked at is for the next release of Ubuntu, perhaps getting a video together. Um, we really need to have kind of a launch video for the next version of Ubuntu mm-hmm. um, that shows off some of its features, but it's still aimed more at the everyday user instead of the technical user. Because um, change logs, <laughs> to be honest, are very boring to read. <laughs> <laughs> I live for change logs. It would be cool to do, a, whether it's a video or, or um, some sort of a graphical uh, presentation that shows what's new in this version of Ubuntu, but then also um, getting out some some web-based advertisements and some print-based advertisements um, for six months. I think that's a, a pretty pretty big goal, but I think we can definitely accomplish it. Then for twelve months, I mean, we're we're looking at we ha- we haven't made any deals or anything. I don't want to start any rumors regarding <laughs> that, but we've discussed trying to uh, achieve some sponsorships to help promote Ubuntu and its partners. Um, for example, you know, if we had an advert that was showing off web browsing on Ubuntu. Obviously, we'd be using the default browser Mozilla Firefox. So if we could okay. make some sort of partnership with Mozilla, that would help the brand identity between Ubuntu and Mozilla. Okay. So um, what about spread Ubuntu? Uh, is, is that something you can uh, integrate with? Because obviously they're a, a, a team or an effort that's pr- uh, uh, trying to promote Ubuntu in the wider community as well. Yeah, um, I definitely think we could, we could work with them, um, both use materials that they've already created and let them use our materials. Uh, uh, our, okay. main goal isn't to be, uh, our goal isn't to be, you know, our own exclusive little club. Mm. We really want to be a community-driven effort to spread the love of Ubuntu. So uh, whatever channels that, that goes through, you know, is it, good. And one of the nice things about this effort is that you don't have to be a developer to get involved. This is a, a great example of something that non-technical people can, uh, can help out with. Yeah. It's actually, the Launchpad group is actually, you know, one of the very large... Um, non-programmer-centric groups. And 
you know, almost all of the recent new members, some of the members in the beginning were programmers, but all of the all, all the recent new members have been non-programmers, which is really cool to see them getting involved in the community effort. Um, you know, with this project, non-programmers can actually find a place to put themselves in to, to contribute to the community because a lot of times non-programmers feel um, sort of left out because they can't, you know, they can't fix bugs or they can't um, write patches. When you... Um when you're going to be creating this content and um, making it available, I, I'm assuming that um, you'll be making it available under a, some kind of open Creative Commons style license. Would I be right in thinking that? Yeah, um, of course we want, we want to use Creative Commons and open uh, open licenses for everything. We, we don't think it would make sense for a, an open source that operating system to have a closed source advertisement. Um, that just kind of seems silly. Sorry, one thing we actually have talked about is now, in the future, there, there are no solid plans for this at, at the moment, but we've talked about opening up a video sharing type site. Um, it wouldn't necessarily host the videos, but it would kind of catalog them and, and give a nice gallery of Ubuntu demonstrations and advertisements and, and even like even maybe a, a mini series sort of, sort of thing. And one of the um, key things about the Ubuntu community is it's global and has a global reach and people who speak many different languages and we translate the product into many languages, and the Ubuntu manual team certainly um, had a lot of um, effort in translating their stuff into multiple languages. Um, have you thought about the the implications of creating video content, audio content, that's um, going to be a lot trickier to translate than a piece of text? Um, right. And how, how are you going to deal with that, or whether you're going to deal with that? Well, one thing we've looked at is doing... Um mostly voiceovers for the video content, you know, not necessarily having somebody on screen speaking. Because um, with a voiceover, it's a lot easier to call in somebody that can translate it and record it without reshooting the entire video. Sure. Um, and with, you know, with a, a video being produced, it, it works similarly where you have text strings that you can go through and translate in before you render the video. So I don't think it's going to be a big problem. One thing that has been discussed in the community is differences in social symbols throughout different cultures, mm. um, and that's something we're definitely looking at, uh, you know, making sure we're not doing a, a, a peace sign that ends up being offensive in some country. That, that also throws back to the non-free software problem that, you know, you could, you could make all your collateral available online in a Creative Commons license, but if no one's got the software to be able to maintain it, then that makes it problematic for you to translate and convert to other languages. So, um, you might find an overhead in that you're going to have to end up translating stuff yourself uh, for other people if they don't have the software. Would that be fair? Yeah, and, and that, that is one um, one thing we're trying to, to get past, and that's, that's one reason that we want a lot of translators on our team, not necessarily... Um, obviously, we'll, we'll make it available for the broader community to translate, but that's why we need translators on our team is so we can work closely with the translators and kind of develop our own workflow within the team. Excellent. Okay, well, where can people go to find out more? Uh, they can visit our, our website at ubuntuadverts.org. Uh, we also have a launchpad team set up, which is ubuntu-advertising. Uh, either one of those will give them plenty of information, and they link to other places where they can get more information. But really, our, our main website's a, a good place to start. Excellent. Well, thank you very much indeed for talking to us this evening, and uh, best of luck thank with the you. new effort. Thanks. Cheers, then. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Yep. Bye. Bye-bye. It's time for Gerald. A bit about Ubuntu. Yes. Just because you're back this week, you can't sneak your name in. <laughs> Not your name. <laughs> the segment name. What's in the bit about Ubuntu this time, Alan? <laughs> uh, there's a new Papercut Ninja team launched. Yes, another Ninja team. Mm. As if we didn't have enough. Do we? Do we have enough ninjas in Ubuntu? I thought there were ninjas about something else as well. Uh, pass. So the idea of this team is that they are helping people to fix paper cuts. Yes. The paper cuts that we've previously discussed. Yeah, you know, the little, tiny little irritating little things, you yes. know, like the name of the trash can. And <laughs> <laughs> name of the home directory. Home directory, <laughs> yes. Those kind of things, yeah. So, um, yeah, the design team have kicked off a, you know, a blog post with uh, trying to get new people to join in with the paper cuts team. Excellent. Um, is it going to make a difference? Because one of the things we've criticised paper cuts before, well, not us specifically, but we have voiced criticism before. Uh, paper cuts, perhaps. <laughs> no, you, you know, did. It wasn't me. <laughs> um, of not actually making much difference to things getting fixed. I don't know. It's hard to say because you. I mean, how many did they do? They they targeted a hundred, like ten a week yeah, or something. Yeah. 
But I think they ended up doing more than that. Um, but the thing about paper cuts is that they only kind of niggle individuals. Like, you know, you one uh. that, that trash one niggled me and a few other people. But it's only once you, you know, you raise awareness of it and get a few people doing it. I think a lot of people would never even notice. Oh, I just looked at the icon. <laughs> it is quite a, quite a cool logo. What was the problem? Oh, you mean the... Sorry. <laughs> Moving on. Carry on. <laughs> and the Ninja team have got quite a cool logo. Oh, well. right, yes, no. Was I was about. talking about a trash can. Uh, can. Okay, that's Sorry. Less, less exciting. Less, shall we... Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think you mean rubbish bin. Oh, uh, yes. Okay, next. Something with... Um, <laughs> I think we leave it to Alan to... Yeah. What, do, we? Why, do we? So, Alan, what's up next? Oh, okay. Uh, Daniel Chen has uh, written a marvellous blog post um, about diagnosing problems with sound issues on Ubuntu. Oh, uh, which is at last. Know, one of those perennial, <laughs> you know, issues that we have with uh, Ubuntu is sound. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, he seems to have... Um, well, Daniel's worked a lot with um, uh, triaging and fixing sound bugs in Ubuntu. And he's written up a nice... A uh, blog post that's you know worth a read. It helps you to uh, report bugs against the right package and things mm-hmm. as well. If it's a mm-hmm. driver issue against one package, if it's a application issue against the other package, or whatever. Yeah, because a lot of people, you know, sound doesn't work. Therefore, it's pulses problem. You know, it's it, every, yeah. everything to do with sound has to do with pulse, which isn't the case. You know, there's there's lots of other things that could be in the way. That's it. Blame pulse audio. Yes, it's the, Blame the pulse. often cry. <laughs> and and th- Daniel is involved with. Pulse, isn't he, in Ubuntu? Uh, yes, he has been, yes. I don't yeah. know if he still is. Okay. Too much, yeah. But yeah, okay, so if you have got audio problems and you want to know how to f- report them, check out that, that blog post. It is pretty interesting, although I was worried... technical. Yeah, it is, it is pretty technical, and I was worried that I was going to have an Andrew Marr moment with the uh, the title of the blog post, with the uh, lots of uh, exclamation... Oh, fix the figures mm, and things. bug already, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and they should avoid that one, though. Cool. Next up, we've got a, a um, an interesting post on the... Uh, technical board mailing list about uh, a bug that's occurred in um it's not really a bug to be honest it's a it's an sru a stable release update ah that's the word i was trying to think of last time what update no stable release update that's when they update a package which is already in a released version yes okay well so we've got blast that back into the old one yes (laughs) (laughs) We'll we'll, we'll go back in time and fix that um so this is about couch db Oh. And the fact that in Lucid, Lucid was released with a particular version of CouchDB, and the back end servers of Ubuntu One have been upgraded to a newer version of CouchDB, oh. and there's an incompatibility between the two. Oh. So that means that <clears throat> they're, they're requesting that um, CouchDB in Lucid could be updated. Mm. And the problem with that is Lucid is an LTS release, and you know, yeah. should we really be breaking an LTS release? Um, by upgrading a package, surely that's fixing it rather than breaking it. Well, it's, yeah, but it's mm, not because they're not, pa- not they're not patching the 0.1 release that was released with Lucid. Yeah, they're going to actually rev it up to 1.0, which is quite a leap. It could potentially um, break other things, couldn't it? Yeah, and that's the problem is they put the call out to say, look, who, what users <laughs> are there out there who use CouchDB, and are yeah. we going to break your and stuff? Lots of people jumped up and down and went, me. <laughs> well, six point six percent of respondents said, um, "Don't do it, please." Uh, but 48% said, yeah, go on, mm. live a little. <laughs> <laughs> but then it becomes a bit of a debate about whether those 6.6 people should be ignored yeah, when they've like signed a, up for something that was supposed yeah, to be stable. Exactly. If a bus only has one passenger, should it still be running? Sorry, that was a bad analogy. The, needs, the needs of the many. <laughs> that way, the that, needs, but yeah. <laughs> um, so. Enough of your Star Trek wacko jacko. Um, <laughs> the, the, the question is, does that mean that it's not working on Lucid at the moment? Uh, I Ubuntu believe so. One <laughs> I, I, you know, yeah. I being, Not you know, being a I've moved on from Lucid years ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, but I believe so, yes. So right, why did okay. they update the server? Uh, performance problems, I believe. Okay. Scaling performance issues, because they've got loads of new users using Ubuntu One, syncing their files up. Oh, to, on Lucid. And, and it's the back-end infrastructure. Well, on Lucid and above yeah. Maverick uh, as well. But Maverick, I think Maverick ships with 1.0, so Maverick's okay. It's only Lucid that's broken. Couldn't they patch the Lucid package to make it think it was... Apparently, it's quite hard. It's yeah. quite a lot of It's only the ones and, and it's zeros. More, <laughs> and it's more, it's more that the protocol's changed. That's, uh. that's issue. So, yeah, it's interesting reading and, you know, amusing whether LTS should be broken or not. What did they decide? I don't think they have yet. Whoa. 
Oh. More probably, next time. I think yeah. that's up to the technical board. Yeah, we'll keep an eye on that. Maybe we'll get yeah. a segment out of it before Christmas. Yes. Only if it breaks for everybody. <laughs> There have been some improvements to uh, the Ubuntu One files. Oh, I'm not having to read all of these. Oh, good. No, I've read them. Um, <laughs> I just doesn't mean I can uh, clearly and concisely are. summarise them. But there have been improvements to the Ubuntu One files uh, sharing system, which has fantastic new features like the ability to stop sharing a <laughs> this file. This was something we asked on day one. Yeah, it was, was pretty much. Hang on, I've shared this with someone. I want to unshare it. Yeah, oh. there, is, there is a way to unshare it, but it involves uh, command line tools and stuff yeah. at the moment, so it's not very good. I... I um, shared a folder with um, Stuart Language, who works on Ubuntu One, deliberately yes. to help coerce them to make removing shares because I made the share an exceptionally long name <laughs> so that it would break the web interface. Right. Uh, just to, like... And did you fill it with inappropriate materials? Uh, I can't remember what it was, but okay. it was very, very long and no spaces, so it broke. Oh, right. it, it wouldn't line wrap. Ah. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah. That's uh, like denial of service attack, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> And the other thing is to be able to stop syncing a, uh, a directory, I think. At the moment, oh, you can enable yes. syncing a directory, but oh, not, really? not easily disable. Oh, so you could go to your documents folder and mm. say, sync with Ubuntu One by clicking a button. Well, this but you within can't, the web you interface. Can't. Oh, okay. So you can stop syncing a, a, a folder you have selected to, sh- to sync on your machine via the web interface. Right, right. okay. But at the moment, you, previously, you'd have to be on the machine to do that. So, yeah, nice little tweaks. And as an Ubuntu One user, things that I greatly appreciate. <laughs> Let me just share a folder with Tony. <laughs> you already had about three shared with me. I had to go through and delete them. <laughs> Nothing in them, unfortunately. So go on. <laughs> yeah, all looking at each other. Me. Uh, Belinda Lopez has kicked off the uh, Ubuntu developer manual and ah. reinvigorated the project. Mm. You're looking quizzical at me, Laura. What does it's, that mean? This isn't the same as the it's Ubuntu the manual we were talking about last week. Right. I'm glad you raised that because uh, some people thought it was. And. Uh, Sing Hosanna, Belinda Lopez has come to save the Ubuntu manual project, and actually that's not the case. It's the yeah. developer manual. Yeah. So this is a this is um supposed to be, I think, a fairly short manual, fairly concise, um, like maybe 10, 15 chapters, something like that, with four to eight pages per chapter. So pretty short to get people kick started doing development on Ubuntu. What so, sorts of things? Um getting started with quickly. Oh. So getting started with um, setting up your development environment, how quickly you can... Um, get quickly. Yeah, get, <laughs> get quickly and then create a project and then upload it onto Launchpad and oh. build a package and all that kind of stuff. Mm. All a fairly high level. So it won't go into all the ones and zeros of Python and stuff like that. It's it's more of a, you know... So kick, getting your start. environment going and how yeah. to Yeah, and then I or... think there's going to be a project in the manual to, you know... Um, like a sample, like a Hello World kind of thing. There'll be all these identical Hello World projects going up on Launchpad. Well, actually, this one's uh, the one they've chosen um, is to have an Identica client or Twitter client, same kind of thing. Um, so we might see lots more Gwibbers out there uh, written, <laughs> using quickly yeah, and Python. Yeah, excellent. The world needs another Twitter client. Yeah. Fair enough. And Adam Williamson, who works for Red Hat as the Fedora Quality Assurance community monkey he calls himself um, has written a blog post about whether unity the much loved new ubuntu gnome shell thing um that well not isn't yeah. when you say much loved um the one that <laughs> seems to have gone quite a bit of controversy on the internet whether that could have turned up in fedora mm. to replace its existing gnome well whether to replace or just to be in their repository and available for people to install i sure. think that's more likely to happen yes yeah, uh, that's not a bad thing, though. It'd be nice to have more eyes Absolutely. on the code. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. And also keeps uh, tabs on the Ubuntu developers so they don't code everything to be too Ubuntu-specific. Yeah. So it's, you know... Ah, that's a good idea. Mm. You know, ah, right, okay. They cater for the differences between one distro and another. would make yeah. more sense. Ah, interesting. Well, we'll get to keep an eye on that one as well. Yeah. I'd like to see that. And that's all in the bit about Ubuntu this time. And now it's time for the feedback. Andy Piper, guest presenter on the last episode, left a comment on the website at podcast.ubuntu-uk.org to say, I just wanted to apologise to Alan Bell for not having spent enough time looking at his overview project. Our discussion on the show our discussion on the show sort of descended into a debate about whether the Prezi style of presentation format is effective or not, and overlooked his actual project to build a better Prezi using OpenGL on Ubuntu. I like the look of this now a lot. 
He's very conscientious, that isn't is. he? I think <laughs> we never apologise about something we've said in a previous episode. Was, <laughs> he, he He's not normal. <laughs> I was going to say, I think that's exactly the first time we've ever had an apology. Um, yeah. But I yeah, all right. that's good. He also listens to the show, so that's also good. Kind of <laughs> 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 Fancy that. <laughs> After our brief discussion about the lack of Kindle readers on the Linux desktop, Phil Thompson emailed us on podcast at ubuntu-uk.org to neatly sum up the silly situation. Amazon's cloud runs on Linux. Kindle runs on Linux. Kindle Reader desktop runs on Mac, a Unix-based OS, and Windows. Kindle Reader apps run on iPhone and Android, a Linux-based OS. So why not Ubuntu desktop? Indeed. Mm. Well... Saying that it runs on Android, Linux-based OS, and therefore should run on desktop Linux. It's not quite the same thing. No, it's not. But well, I think the point he's making here is... Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's, it's very, not like... It's yeah. fairly cross-platform. And yeah, not, no. It, okay. Amazon don't seem to be particularly wedded to any one No, platform. absolutely. It does seem a bit silly that you're going to go for so many platforms and leave one out. Mm. The one that least people use. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's puppy Linux as well. There are more. I am right in saying there are more iPhone and Android users than there are Ubuntu users on the on the planet. I wouldn't be surprised. And particularly, I don't in know America, what the orders of magnitude of numbers of Android phones there are on the planet, but yeah, it's got to be more than like twelve, twenty million, or whatever Ubuntu users there are. So, yeah, we are probably the smallest demographic. Oh, mm. boo hoo hoo! <laughs> no Kindle for us. Mark underscore UK left a comment on the website. Just listening to the Mid- Midnight Flyer, which is episode 2020. 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. 20. Has been uh, a long season. <laughs> oh. What's up with Ubuntu fanboys deleting KDE? Those idiots on another UK Linux podcast were deleted from my podcast feeds because of KDE hate. Seems to be a pointless remnant of the desktop wars of years ago. It's all free software and petty-minded desktops and Obery still advances no free or open source development. So do BSD users sneer at Linux users? There is plenty intrinsically wrong with old-fashioned GTK too, but the desktop wars ended years ago, didn't you hear? He sounds like a KDE user to me. Uh, Can't well. have too many of them around here. <laughs> <laughs> so were we slagging KDE off? I don't, I don't remember. Know. We might have teased um, you slightly, but not no, in that episode. I think we did when we were talk- we talked about something to do with uh, removing packages. And oh, and you wanted to make space by deleting KDE. Yes. <laughs> yes. So it was yes. Alan's fault. Alan's fault, <laughs> yes. yes. I'm glad I, we sorted that one out. I was being humorous and clearly failed. <laughs> nope. It's all right. Do we, not consider this apology. This, <laughs> we, you need a, you need Only Andy Piper does apologies. You need a little arrow pointing down to your head saying, this may be a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Unlikely. <laughs> it's really an attempt at a joke. Well, we have Mark on the show and he's a KDE user. So you can say he's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> That was a joke. Uh, not that I'm a KDE user, I do use KDE. That's what I mean, yeah. Yes. Um, we got more feedback about bug reporting. First up, Frustrated Frank left a comment on the website. One of your contributors complained about finding a bug with Grub2 and being unable to get a solution or even an answer from the Ubuntu community. I can only echo the frustration and add that it gets even worse when you found a workaround and published it on both Launchpad and on Ask Ubuntu. Please tell the person concerned that he might find the solution by looking at bug number 649345 on Launchpad. That's 649345. <laughs> Did <laughs> I say set that, that to a jingle? No, no, who's oh, repeating, just it, repeating it? it? The radio style. Oh. <laughs> just in case he missed it the first time. Okay. Okay, well, at least there's a potential solution out there. But, um, yeah, it doesn't really resolve the problem of where to ask all these questions. Ask him to. That's the one. Email into a podcast and one of their listeners might tell you. Well, <laughs> yes, we could be a good forum for that. Ask Tony. No. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Phelan Whiteley put down his teapot for long enough to email in to explain <laughs> why he doesn't log bugs. Both my other half and I use Kubuntu every day as our main work machines. The main reason we don't log bugs is that they don't ever seem to be fixed. There does seem to be more... A special sorry, there does seem to be a special handshake or phrase required before your bug gets attention. We even search, find ones that affect us, and subscribe to those, and out of a list of fifteen or so, none have been fixed. Some are big and some small. That isn't saying all bugs are ignored, but the vast majority seem to slip by, so the effort put into reporting them seems wasted. It doesn't make me stop using the distro, but sometimes you feel like it's more painful than it should be. And I like this little postscript down here. 
Finally, a KDE user. Mark, you are an awesome addition and a nice antidote to that ex- excessive gnomishness. <laughs> Why did you just go and read that bit out, Mark? Honestly. <laughs> he has a point. It, you know, I've got excessive bugs, gnomishness. Bugs that, <laughs> I mean, bugs. Sorry, carry on. I've got bugs that I've filed and they're not, they haven't been fixed yet. But, yeah. And I don't know, you know, I think everyone does. But what do you do about it? Do you go and hunt down the developers and annoy them and make them even less likely to spend time talking to you? I don't know. It's the only thing you do is file them and, you know, keep updating them if you need to. Or learn to program and fix them yourself. Uh, (laughs) Yes. And we got a dent on identity.ca slash UPC from Alpaca Herder, who commented... The reference on the latest episode of UUPC to not looking at Identica much bothered me. Or is that not looking at Identica much bothered me? Ooh. I read yes, it the probably. other way. I read it the way Alan did. That's oh, I read it. Isn't oh. it? Okay. Either uh, way, it, it, we did read it. The same thing. It's the same thing, yes. <laughs> and we did read it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So we must have looked. Someone yeah. did anyway. Mm. Yes. Yeah. I, I, it it sounds like me. <laughs> I don't remember saying it, but I expect it probably was. I, I don't look at Identica as much as I could. I don't have an Identica client on my phone, but yet I have a Twitter client on my phone. Uh, and uh, I, I do have, um, uh, what's it called? Gwiver, that's the one. Uh, yeah. and, and I do see the stuff you know coming in, but I don't know. There's just more people tweet than don't. Yeah. It's as simple as that. Fair enough. Yeah, a good mobile client might make some difference though. Yes. Cool. Make it happen. <laughs> you don't Go learn to program. I should write. Oh, oh. And then I'll file a bug against it. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, after our command line love earlier about Nmap, Graham Bleach told us how to turn broadcast ping back on again. Cool. With a, with a bit of a poke in the kernel, by the look of it. Bit of, bit of a poke in the kernel. <laughs> a a... Watch out for those. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. So we'll put that in the show notes then, will we? Yes. Okay, so you can find out how to do that. Yes. Excellent. And that's all of your feedback this time. You can find out how to get in touch with us on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org, including voicemail numbers and Twitter feeds, and Identica, uh, Facebook and IRC channels. <laughs> Let us know what you think of the show, or give us your thoughts about Ubuntu and the community around it. Yes, we'll be back in two weeks for the last episode of this season. Ooh. Maybe the last episode ever. <laughs> <laughs> Are you announcing something live now, Alan? Oh, I said maybe. Okay, maybe. It'll certainly be a Christmas episode. Yes. It will. We'll it have will. mince pies. Yes. Ooh. I was going to say mulled wine, but you'll you'll all be driving. That's so, a, isn't, not if we mulled uh, wine have all the alcohol cooked uh, off. Not if we uh, move it to Studio B, and, uh, <laughs> and then I'll be blind drunk. <laughs> cool. Yeah, we've done that. <laughs> yeah, that didn't go. Well. Didn't <laughs> you make Andy SC cross? You have to send another email in. <laughs> anyway, thank you for listening, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.